In this final chapter of the module, we will introduce how to use the slit lamp for evaluation of the ED patient. The slit lamp can be a daunting device to use with all of its various knobs and settings. In the ED, you will rarely use all of these knobs and settings. This module will focus on the key functions of the slit lamp for the emergency medicine evaluation of the patient with an eye complaint. While slit lamps in different EDs may be slightly different, they all have common basic components and functions. With the slit lamp, you will be able to obtain a magnified exam of eye structures, including the lids, sclera, cornea, and anterior chamber of the eye. Thus, the slit lamp can be helpful in the evaluation of the red eye, such as in iritis and uveitis. Slit lamp examination of the eye can also supplement your evaluation of patients with eye pain to help look for evidence of corneal abrasions and foreign bodies. You should not use the slit lamp on patients who cannot fully sit up, such as those with spinal precautions, and those patients that cannot follow commands. Besides having the slit lamp, you should have ready a fluorescine strip, an alcohol pad, normal saline or anesthetic drops, a cotton-tipped swab, and gloves. Before you begin, clean the parts of the slit lamp that the patient will contact. A small alcohol pad will suffice. If the chin rest has disposable covers, remove the top one, leaving the clean one underneath it. There is a knob at the base of the slit lamp to turn it on after it is plugged into an outlet. The patient should be able to comfortably rest his or her chin on the chin rest by simply leaning forward. The base may be adjusted higher or lower to achieve this. Press the lever underneath the base table of the slit lamp. Some slit lamps require you to depress a pedal with your feet at the bottom of the device. Now, direct the patient to place his or her chin on the chin rest. There are black eye level markers on the vertical poles of the headrest. These should be aligned with the patient's eyes in neutral position. To adjust the height of the chin rest, twist the knob just below the chin rest until the pupils are aligned with the black stripes. If the patient is not in this position, you will likely not be able to examine the entire eye as it will not be in range of the examining light beam. The patient's forehead should rest against the forehead rest to keep the head stationary. If the patient moves from the head rest, the eye structures will go out of focus during the examination. To release the slit lamp so it can freely move on top of the base table, untighten the locking screw located at the same level as the slit lamp base. When you are transporting the slit lamp between rooms or locations, this screw should be tightened back. To move the beam of light during the examination, you can use the joystick on the base or move the base itself. For gross movements, move the base. For finer movements, move the joystick in the direction that you would like the slit lamp to go. These movements with the joystick will achieve focus of eye structures. You should be looking through the microscope when using fine focusing with the joystick. To move the slit lamp up towards the ceiling or down towards the floor, you will need to twist the joystick clockwise or counterclockwise. The slit lamp beam can be changed to be wider or more narrow, and taller or shorter. To adjust the vertical dimensions of the light beam, twist the knob located just below the light filter tray and direct it towards the examiner. To adjust the horizontal dimensions, twist the knob at the base of the swinging arm of the slit lamp. Broadening of the beam helps to illuminate more of the eye during examination and surface study. Narrowing of the beam is used for patient comfort and examining the depth of structures like the anterior chamber and cornea. There is a knob right in front of the eyepiece to change the magnification of the slit lamp. If you only see a small portion of the eye, you may be looking with too high a magnification and you should go down in magnification so that you can see more of the eye initially. Start by using the lowest magnification and the maximum height and width of the light beam that is comfortable for the patient. The microscope and the light source are mounted on separate swivel arms. In the basic exam, swing only the light source arm to about 45 degrees to the temporal side of the eye. Have the patient focus on a target so that their eyes are still. Sweep across the upper lid and then back over the lower lid. After that, examine the cornea looking for irregularities. You should also note the presence or absence of ciliary flush just around the cornea. Next, examine the anterior chamber. 
In the emergency department, examination of the anterior chamber is mainly used to assess for cells and flare, which are indications of inflammation. A 16 to 20 degrees of magnification is generally used. The inner light source arm of the lamp is swung so that the light source is 45 to 60 degrees temporally and directly medially. As bright of a light as the patient will tolerate should be used. The beam of light is generally 2 millimeters wide by 3 to 4 millimeters high and should fall on the cornea and the iris. Focus on the area between the cornea and iris to look for cells and flare. Normally, the anterior chamber is clear and dark, termed as the anterior chamber is quiet. This video clip shows an example of cells and flare, which are abnormal findings in the anterior chamber. Note the tiny reflective flecks between the cornea and the iris. These are cells. The haze, similar to a movie projector light in a dark room, is flare. Next, the cornea should be evaluated for defects. Fluorescein stains the cornea anytime the epithelium is compromised. The dye doesn't actually stain the cells themselves, but pools within defects, making it possible to detect areas of damaged cornea. Have the patient remove any contact lenses as fluorescein stains soft contact lenses. To place fluorescein in the eye, have the patient tilt their head back or have them in a semi-recumbent position. Open the packaged fluorescein strip and moisten with a drop of saline or water. If the patient has tearing, then no saline or water may be needed. Gently pull down the lower lid and lightly touch the fluorescein strip to the palpebral conjunctiva of the lower lid. Then, have the patient blink several times to distribute the stain. You may be surprised how little fluorescein is needed for an adequate exam. Change the light filter of the slit lamp to the cobalt blue setting. This may be the same knob as the vertical light beam adjustment knob, as in this case. Keep on twisting until the cobalt blue light is seen. Do not confuse this for the green light filter. Once the patient is in the correct position in the slit lamp, focus on and examine the entire cornea, looking for areas of fluorescent green uptake. Normally, there should be no areas of fluorescent uptake in the cornea. Here is an example of herpes keratitis. Note the green dendritic uptake of the cornea compared to the rest of the normal cornea. To fully examine the entire cornea, the patient's eyelids may need to be retracted. You can do so by using cotton-tipped swab. Place the cotton tip on the upper or lower lid and twist the swab to gently retract the lid. You can also ask the patient to look slightly up or down to visualize the superior and inferior aspects of the cornea during your slit lamp examination. For a patient with a potential foreign body causing an eye complaint, the upper lid should be averted for examination. Explain to the patient what you will be doing and then grab a clean cotton-tipped swab. Grasp the upper lid and eyelashes with your thumb and index finger and pull outward and slightly downward. Gently push down on the tarsal plate with the cotton swab while lifting the lashes up. The everted lid is held in place with your thumb or the swab while examining under the slit lamp. 